Welcome once again to my Nostalgia Podcast. This is Jack's Throwback Attack. Hello there, thanks for listening in again. It's interview time once again, and this time around, it's someone who has solely written for children's TV rather than appear on it. Lots of iconic shows from the past are discussed in this interview. I hope you enjoy it. So I'm pleased to have with me today a writer, Lee Pressman. Hello there. Hello. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Um, down here in London, it's uh, been a very nice sunny day. Indeed, it has not been too bad up here as well um, in Wolverhampton. So all good, all good. Um, I have to say, actually, I think this is the first time on the podcast I've had anybody who predominantly has written for children's television rather than appear on it. So that's that's something mm. different and that's going to be exciting. So um, I suppose I better start off with the beginning. How did you get into writing for children's television? Well, um, I watched a show on telly many years ago called Play Away. And it was, uh, I thought it was great. Brian Kent was very very funny and floella was on it and um i just really enjoyed it and i don't know why but i just thought i wouldn't mind having a go writing for that show so i sent them a bundle of unsolicited stuff there was there was jokes there were songs there were poems all sorts of stuff and i sat back and waited and unbelievably i got a reply back um saying yeah, thanks for sending this stuff. Um, we'll put it on our reserve file. We, you know, we might use it sometime. Um, but there's one joke we like so much, we're going to put it on this week's show and uh, we're going to send you four quid because the BBC used to pay eight pounds a minute in those days. So that little joke was on Play Away. And then they said, would you like to come up and meet us and talk about writing for the show? And very exciting went up to the bbc and um was shown around and um i started writing for playaway uh which meant writing tons of stuff sending it in and they would pick what bits they liked you know um but yeah when i look back on it now i was i i've got all the you know the paperwork I, i was sending in dozens and dozens of songs and sketches and poems and you know I say they were paid by the minute, so if you had a long sketch, <laughs> you were in the money. Um, but yeah, it was great. That was that was my first. Uh, and when I started as well, it was quite exciting because they they brought two new young actors in the show. Um, one was Tony Robinson, and the other one was Anita Dobson. So that was pretty cool. I yeah. had lots of other great guests as well. Yeah, at least pretty cool. That's that's a cool way to start. I'm not. You kind of wonder would anybody um, get a foot in the door these days just by sending in unsolicited no, letters? There would be absolutely no way you could do that. You know, this all happened within weeks. You know, I sent them some stuff. I got a letter back within a week. Um, you know, a couple of weeks later, I was. You know, you know, I was, I was still. Um, I was a teacher at that time. I was a primary school teacher, so this was part time. But you know, um, it was it was fabulous to. You know, every Friday they would record live in front of an audience and I'd drive up to the BBC, drive into the BBC, (laughs) just park somewhere and then spend a couple of hours wandering around all the other studios watching Doctor Who and Top of the Pops and whatever else was going on there and uh, end up watching Playway. That would never happen now. The security, you'd never get in the door, you know. No. Uh, I've had a few people tell me that, that they were able to wander around and stuff. But yeah, it's a different times, very different times. That's very cool. That's a very cool way to, uh, to to break into it. Had you always, deep down, wanted to be a writer? Yes. Um, yeah, I was always really keen on writing, and I thought I would probably end up... What I wanted to do is write children's books, uh, which I have done a few, but um, I got completely sort of sidelined into telly and... Um, done that ever since but uh yeah i did always want to write and i did want to write children's stuff as well good stuff good stuff well so play away was like your first uh writing credit mm. on television so i had a look at um on imdb what you what you'd written um over the years i was looking at some of the early stuff um so it, it mentions that you wrote um a few episodes of butter moon is that is that true yeah, uh, well, um, not quite. Uh, so just to carry on from Play Away, when yeah. I was writing Play Away, they were also making Play School as well. And I thought, right, I'll have a go at getting into Play School. So I wrote some stories, sent them into Play School, 
This time, it wasn't so lucky. They said, no, no, we don't really want those stories. So I said, well, I don't, oh, well, I've got all these stories, so I don't know what to do with them. And on the other side, Rainbow was on. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, I have stories every day. I'll send them some. St-. So I sent them these stories, and they started to ask me, uh, they started to uh, use these stories. So it was great. So I was writing for Play Away on the BBC, and I was writing stories for Rainbow. Well, once I got into Thames television, you know, Thames were doing all sorts of stuff, and that, led on to a whole load of stuff and one of them was button the moon um i didn't actually write the scripts for button moon but each episode of button moon had a little story in it and i got to write some of the stories that were in button moon when mr spoon looked through his telescope he would see some story going so the puppeteers on button moon and funnily enough i'd actually seen button moon because when i was a teacher um these puppeteers had come round to my school where I was working and they'd done a show. So I'd actually seen them before I'd even started writing for them. They just said, come around to our workshop. We've got all these random puppets. Um, Choose whatever ones you like and write some stories about them. So I went round and I said, oh, they've got a camel. Oh, I could use that. And they've got some, I can't remember what else. Oh, anyway, yeah, they had a dog and a baby. And so I said, anyway, yeah, so I did work on Button Moon, but I didn't write the Button Moon segments of the show. That's fair enough. And two iconic shows, really, uh, which are still fondly remembered. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Zippy and George were just my favourite characters. They were just a great double act. I even proposed at one time. I said, why don't we just do a spin-off sitcom of George and Zippy? But that never happened. But when you were writing Rainbow, they were I thought they were the, the, the heart of Rainbow. They were wonderful, you know. And uh, I know yeah, the, the guy who did the puppets, um, Ronnie LeDrew, who you probably have come across. Yeah. Um, he's fantastic. I mean, I, I, I still know him, and um, I've worked on various other things with him. He's fabulous. But, um, yeah, the original Rainbow crew, you know, with Ro- Roy Skelton doing the voices and Jeffrey, Rod Jane and Freddie, I, I still keep in touch with Jane now. And, um, yeah, yeah it, was, it was a fun show to do, you know. Uh, so being at Thames Television with those, the producers and directors of that show, led on to all the other stuff I did at Thames, you know, because once you were kind of in there, you... Um, and I suppose the next big one after that was getting asked to come up with um, what became T-Bag, which, uh, who knew, was going to run for nine years. And that came about because the uh, the, the head of children's television, uh, Marjorie Sigley at the time, she was very into education and she said oh, it would be great to do a series of shows all about words and letters and you know um and the f- so yeah how did it come about let me think which one came first was it tea anyway tea bag was one of them um there was another one called words 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 which was pretty unsuccessful to be honest um Actually, words, 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 it's quite a funny thing, actually, because w- one of her ideas was to do a show about words. And so they commissioned, as it uh, never happened, they commissioned 13 half hour episodes and they had a writer who was going to write them all. And of, that's that's madness, you know. I mean, have one writer going to do that? Anyway, so they suddenly put out an appeal saying, we need, we need writers desperately. And they got in touch with me and said, have you got any stuff left over from Play Away that we could use? <laughs> I said, yes, I've got quite a lot of stuff left over from all the, reje- all the rejected stuff. So I started sending them stuff and I wrote new stuff as well for Words, Words, Words. But yeah, that was um, that was how I came to meet Grant Cathro because Grant was my writing partner for years and he was also bailing out Words, Words, Words by writing lots of stuff. And... Um, That show wasn't too successful, but it did lead me to meet Grant, which was obviously a wonderful happening. And I got asked by Marjorie to come up with the next, so that was the words one. Mm -hmm. The next part of her sort of major plan was to do letters of the alphabet. She said, could you come up with an idea for a letters of the alphabet show? And I I came up with the idea of a a little girl is on a board game. It's very Alice in Wonderland. You know, a little girl's on a board game. She travels through the land of T and the land of A and the land of whatever, you know. 
And uh, once you get to the land of tea, there's a character called Teabag, who's the villain of the piece. And yeah, they said, yeah, let's do it. And I thought, oh, this is going to be a big job. You know, I mean, I can't, you know, I'm still, I can't remember. I was still, yeah, I think I was still teaching at that time. So I thought this is like a 10 part series. So I contacted this guy I'd met called Grant Cathro and said, you fancy writing this with me? And that's how our working relationship started. And um, yeah, we went on to write 94 episodes of Teabag featuring all sorts of amazing people you know um you know everyone from bernard breslau to glenda jackson and peggy mount and all these lots of sitcom actors frank thornton and burt quok i mean it was incredible uh so yeah teabag was a really big deal it was and then i gave up teaching at that point and um and that's when grant and i you know started our long relationship really yeah, oh, cool. Yes, because you did write uh, quite a few series together, which I'll touch upon a little bit later mm. on in the chat. Mm. Uh, Teabag is one of those series um, that is still very fondly remembered. I'm, I'm aware that it has had a DVD release. Um, and um, when CITV had its uh, 30th anniversary in 2013, they did, did uh, rerun uh, an episode as well, which went down quite well. Um, yeah. What was it like writing for um, Elizabeth Estenson? She played that role so brilliantly. Oh didn't she? Yeah, she, we were so lucky, you know. I mean, we didn't have anything to do with the casting. Mm -hmm. And on the first day when Liz turned out, oh, yeah, you, you couldn't have asked for anybody better. She was fantastic. And then we were equally lucky when and the little boy John Hasler turned up to play T-shirt, because, I mean, he was only, like, eight, I think. And those two together were just fantastic. Um, obviously, they were the heart of that show, you know, their relationship, their ups and downs and quarrels and arguments. Um, so, yeah, they were... It was great. It was really great, because Grant and I were very fond of double acts like Laurel and Hardy. So, you know, having a little double act in the middle of Teabag was great. Um, yeah, Liz is... I mean, we were, I worked with Liz on a few other things afterwards. I did a, a radio series with her um, where she was a detective, and um, she was a detective called Kitty Purwell, and her sidekick was Tim Spall. And that was, the, again, a great double act. Um, and a few other things. She's guest, obviously, Mike and Angelo, she turned up in, and I think, she, I can't remember, she was, oh, she was in another series I did called Poltius. But, yeah, we, we love Liz a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah, she did uh, some good good work there, and uh, yeah, she's fantastic in Mike and Angelo as well as uh, Mrs. Fox Bentley. Mrs. Fox Bentley. I have to get it right. Um, <laughs> Fox, Fox, Fox Bender or whatever, and Mike, yeah, yeah, Angelo just called her something different every week. Yes. You know? <laughs> that's why I always have to think for a second, as I say. It was, it was a bit of a shock, where, or not a shock, because the, the beginning of Tea Bag was a, a bit troubled. There were a lot, you know, there were the we there, there was the, the director of the first first few first five series was a very difficult guy and um it was it was hard working with him but Liz after I think five series said she was going to leave which was horrifying for us and they said yeah no we'll get somebody else don't worry it's a you know, popular show because we were getting like five or six million you know viewers it was incredible and then um Georgina Hale turned up now I'd seen Georgina in loads of like Ken Russell films and things, you know, playing obviously quite different roles. And Grant and I were really taken aback. We didn't, because her performance was so zany and off the wall, we couldn't kind of get our heads around it to begin with, but we ended up loving it. You know, it was so mad that, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was great. You know, by this time, T-shirt was about 17 or something. So, Again, it was a completely different, weird relationship going on there. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh, am I right in thinking, because my knowledge of Teabag is, because it was a little bit before my mm. time, but I have you know looked it up online. Mm. Am I right in thinking that every series was different, different setting of some kind? Yeah, yeah. Well, every episode was. Um, so I'll have to send you, by the way, my DVD that Grant and I made a DVD where we reunited all the tea bag personnel and okay. we filmed it all around here at my house over two weekends and that might help <laughs> you to see because <laughs> we because um so yeah tea bag was a really unusual series in a way because each series was a quest it was an ongoing quest so there were 10 episodes but each 
episode was set in a different place. They were chasing around through time and space. So you'd have a Roman episode followed by a cowboy episode followed by a French foreign list. So it, it, it was incredible. You know, the, 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 the end, the beginning and the end episodes were in the same place. And there were lots of scenes in the tea room. But other than that, every episode was different. So there were 94 locations. And because it was quite a cheap show early on, Grant and I would say, we'd like to do one, I don't know, set in a forest. And the producer would say, great, but you'd have to use that forest in another episode um, because we can't afford to, you know, to do that again. So, so yeah, it was great. It was like doing um, a series of carry-on films. You know, we'd do a Roman episode and it would be, you know, carry-on up the toga and then it would be, you know, carry-on in the Wild West and gangsters in the 1920s. It was fabulous, you know, but it was difficult, obviously, because because the budget was so low and the sets, if you, you've seen the sets were so early on were pretty dire, actually. They were just very flat, you know, but we justified that by saying, oh, okay, it's on a board game. That was the first series. But the next series was in something else. It was, I think it was in a, a music box or something. And it went on, every series was in a different kind of, oh, come on, it was all sorts of different things. But yeah, it was, uh, yeah, we were, we were described in The Guardian as being somewhere... Um, between um, Doctor Who and Blackadder <laughs> because of this, you know, the time and space and different historical settings. Yeah. But it was really entertaining for us to write. Good stuff. That's that's really cool. Um, so to, to move on to the next one, really, and I guess there was some kind of um, fancy element to it as well, uh, Mike and Angelo, um, which is a show that um, I love, and, of course, Tim Whitnell's been on the, uh, the podcast before. Um, what was the idea behind that show? Because it was very different. Well, that followed on from exactly what I was just telling you. Um, because of this thing with Teabag, that every week was a different setting, the new head of... Um, Thames Television, um, who was Alan Horrocks, said, surely we can do a show that doesn't involve so many sets. Couldn't we just do one that's set in one place? So we said, well, yeah, I suppose we could. It could be a house. Um, I mean, we didn't know it was going to go on for 12 years, obviously. So we said, well, if it's going to be in somebody's house, there's got to be some kind of supernatural or unusual element that we bring into the house. So that was how Mike and Angelo started. And I've got the original, the original premise is called Monster in the House, which obviously it wasn't. It got changed quite a lot. But when we first started, as far as Grant and I were concerned, Angelo was an angel. And he'd come to sort of befriend Mike, who was lonely. Um, that's why he called Angelo, you know. And in our own minds, we saw this character as looking like I don't know, a cross between, I don't know, David Bowie and Michael Jackson. It was going to be this angelic kind of figure, you know. So when we went to the very first read-through, again, we had nothing to do with the casting, and there was this bloke there called Tyler Butterworth who said, hello, I'm playing Angelo. We kind of gasped because we thought, that's not how we visualise Angelo at all, you know. Um, but, yeah, Tyler was great, and as the series progressed people started to write about it and say, it's that zany alien Angelo again. And we said, no, he's not, an, he's not an alien. He's not. And by the time we got to about the second or third series, we thought, oh, let's just have him be an alien. We'd never said he was an angel, you know. So that's how he became um, an alien. Uh, but as I say, we never knew we were going to be writing in that house stuff for 123 episodes. So it was pretty, it was quite an achievement, really, to do so many different stories where we've hardly ever went out of that house. You know, we brought in all sorts of other incredible elements into the house, but we didn't really go out of it at all. And yeah, it got, you know, we had so many changes of personnel over the years you know after two years you know tyler wanted to leave and we thought oh god now what do we do well we'll just do a doctor who and we'll sort of transform him into another um you know uh, uh, into tim whitnell which was fantastic because tim was just so lively and 
you know, adventurous and imaginative. It brought a completely new energy to the show. Because originally the show, you probably know, I mean, you've seen the first episode, it, I, it was more of a comedy drama. Yep. It didn't even have canned laughter. Um, they, it's Thames insisted on using canned laughter all the time. So, you know, it became a sitcom, really. Uh, although there were some quite moving moments, you know, along the way. Uh, but then we started to find, you know, other people wanted to leave, like various mics came and went, you know, and so we don't know how Mike's going to leave now. What do we do? You know, we'll change Mike. Um, uh, and at one one point we had a series with no mic at all in it. You know, another series we had a girl called Michaela who was kind of Mike. And then, you know, Shelley Thompson, who was, you know, one of the, obviously they're an original, she left and oh God, no, you know, we've got to, well, luckily we knew Katie Murphy and we thought she was great and we suggested her. And funnily enough, that last kind of trio of Katie and Mike and Angelo, I think were the were some of the best episodes actually. Yeah. Um, and so it did, you know, it got better and better, I thought, you know, as it went on. And those three, you know, you've probably seen that Katie features in many of our shows because we do like her. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that was incredible that it went on for 12 years. And it, uh, uh, and it was running at the same time. I mean, Grant and I get together quite often and we say, how do we do that? You know, we were writing Teabag, we were writing Mike and Angela, and we were writing Spats simultaneously. Those shows were just on all the time. It was incredible, really. Indeed it was, yeah. And um, I don't think there are many sitcoms or children especially children's shows that can say that they ran for that long um mm. which is incredible and it, like you say with the, the the change of the cast actually um had a, a message um i think on twitter a while ago that described the show perfectly um and i hope you get the reference but somebody said uh, mike and angelo was the triggers broom of kid shows because of the yeah, fact yeah, that they yeah. had a different it was yeah it changed yeah, so I don't, I mean, I, yeah there was nobody who None of the original cast left by the end of it. Um, ah, you know, but by the end of it, you know, we had Liz Estenson living next door as Mrs. Fultz Bentley. You know, we had some wonderful guest stars. Yeah. You know, Christopher Lily, Ron Moody. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a story. Um, we decided one day. We said, wouldn't it be interesting if Angelo's dad appears? What would Angelo's dad be like? And we thought for a while. We thought, what? Are we somebody said. Norman Wisdom, he would be great. Wouldn't that be great? You know, he said, okay. So they wrote to Norman Wisdom and sent him the script of that episode. And um, we were a bit amazed because we, we got a letter back from Norman Wisdom's agent saying, Norman does not want to do this show. Um, he thinks it, he, he's read the script and he thinks it's too smutty. We went, what? <laughs> what, what did he see in it? That we, um, but anyway, uh, that resolved itself brilliantly because we got Ron Moody, who was fantastic, you know. So, yeah, we had all these great people in, like we did in Teabag. We had lots of great guests and a really solid central cast by the end of it. Yeah. Might be hard to pick one because you did so many, but do you have a favourite episode out of all those many that oh, you did? Oh, God. Uh, it's, it's pretty hard. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, yeah, I, I shared the one, uh, one thing, because obviously the, what I haven't mentioned is that Grant and I wrote together, you mm -hmm. know, and we sat down in the room I'm sitting in now every day for, you know, years, you know, writing Teabag, Mike and Andrew. But as, as, it, as the series went on and on, um, we said, well, why don't we just plan out the series? We'll plan out the stories and we'll write six of them together and then you go and write two and I'll write two separately. We can save a bit of time. So that's how we worked it. We started doing that as well on Mike and Angelo. And to be honest, it, it got to a point where even though we planned out the stories, we, we might write five. Well, Grant wanted another. He, he, found, he said he was going to write Mike and Angelo with his old writing partner, Alex Bartlett. So he went off and wrote five episodes and I'd write five on my own. Um, the one... Well, it's actually, it's, it spans two, really. I wrote one about Hank Sinatra, the singing cowboy. And um, I really liked doing that one because I like songs, I like music, and um, I 
you know, Tim was up for doing, obviously, the music because he's so musical. So that episode I really liked. And then I was able to kind of bring it back in another episode where, you know, they were promoting the ice cream. So I think that those those two I, I, did, I did like, actually, very much. Um, and I've st- that, do you remember that costume that Angelo wore, that red yes. cowboy? Mm-hmm. I've got it upstairs. Oh, God. <laughs> I, I inherited it. And I have actually worn it while it's at a fancy dress party. Um, oh, gosh. Yeah, that, that, that was good, yeah. Well, it's funny, really, because um, cause, um, obviously my show finished in 2000, but I did have a videotape um, which had uh, a couple of episodes on, and one of them being the um, the one with the with the ice cream. It turns out mm. I didn't know until much later was actually the very last very last show that was done. Yeah. I never saw the first one until it appeared on YouTube oh. a couple of years ago, and um, they're both great. But yeah, the one where he promotes the ice cream and loses his voice and mimes to a tape mm. that's on the wrong speed is something that still now makes me laugh. It's good, really good. funny. Um, I think yeah. I mentioned to Tim that that was one of my favourite episodes as well, and he said he, he yeah. loved doing that one. It's a good yeah, one. Yeah, no, I'm always trying to put songs into shows if I can get them in. You know, I mean, Mike and Andrew, uh, Tea Bag, we had loads of songs. You know, we were writing Grant and I were writing songs all the time. We had a very good composer called Terry Trower who did the music. Um, I've gone on trying to sneak songs into everything. You know, from Oh, well, Fine and Sam, or sort of, whenever I can get a song in, I kind of <laughs> try and sneak it in. But, um, but yeah, Andrew, well, you know, because Tim was so musical, it, we, I think there were a few musical episodes, but that one was the one that, um, yeah, I was very fond of that, actually. Good. It's nice to know that we have a similar favourite episode. We'll share the same yeah, favourite episode. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. So you mentioned um, just about Spat. So that started roughly about the same time as Mike and Angelo. Mm. Um, so that was um, so it was set in the UK. It was a, a burger bar that was Canadian run. One thing I've, I've noticed about Spats and the early Mike and Angelos is there's a very American kind of feel, and there's a lot of uh, actors mm. in from o- uh, over the pond. Um, what was the because that uh, that was quite unusual, really, wasn't it? What was the reason for them to kind of have this very heavy North American? I, I just think Thames Television wanted to get into the American market and they kept on trying to put Americans in, or Canadians usually, um, thinking we might be able to sell this show to America. It never, never happened. Yeah. But I think that was, yeah, I mean, we when I think when we, I can't remember, but I think when we first started Mike and Angelo, I've got a feeling that Rita and Mike had come to London from the north of England. I'm not even sure they were American. It didn't really matter. They, it, they had to be you know, out of their normal environment. I think as probably somebody at Thames Television said, you know what, make them American. <laughs> you know, we might be able to sell this to America. That didn't happen. With Spats, they, well, that, that was quite tricky, actually, because they, they had um, a, a Canadian co-production so it was this this was not just Thames this was Thames and a Canadian company doing it together so obviously there had to be you know Canadians in it and that actually made the first series of spats really difficult because Grant and I in the UK wrote half the scripts and the Canadian writers wrote the other scripts then we switched script we've sent them our scripts they sent us uh, the, uh, their scripts they hated our scripts and we hated their scripts. And I found an old letter the other day where the producer in Canada had said about Grant and I, said something like, these guys are attempting to write a sitcom with no jokes in it. So that was the kind of, it was a real battleground. So they said, well, the only thing we can do is we'll send over to England our best writer and he can sit down with these English guys and come up with something that we all you know, accept. So they sent over this poor guy um, and Grant and I had to sit in a room with him for about three months while we went over every one of the 13 scripts. And it was like pulling teeth. It was so difficult because our the English way of writing sitcoms is quite different from the American, you know. I mean, as you know, um, well, 
Canadian North American scripts are based on the gag. Everything has to be, you know, sharp, funny gags one after another. Whereas in England, you know, we have wonderful shows like, I don't know, 40 Towers, One Foot in the Grave, Father Ted. It's not all joke, 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 joke. You know, we like the characters and we like the weird situations. But this American guy was just, we need more gags. We need more jokes. So... The first series of spats wasn't perfect as far as we were concerned. We were really hampered by this, you know, co-production. After the first series, they Tim said, we don't know, we, we're not going to do a co-production anymore. We're going to do it all ourselves. And they handed it over to Grant and I. And we reckon that was a pinnacle of our writing, the second and third series of spats, because not only were we allowed to do what we like, we were allowed to do the casting, which was incredible. That is so unheard of. So we would write the scripts, we'd send them to a casting director, uh, and she would choose six actors, and we would audition them. So we had a fantastic time auditioning, you know, and during that course of auditions we discovered you know one day we had a part for a guy who was um i think he was a scaffolder in one episode nim walks reese ifans you know he was completely unknown but he thought this guy's brilliant you know we'll write him into it a few more times the same thing happened with david harewood fantastic actor walked in um he said do you want me to do this in my you know london accent or my brummy accent he said i'll oh, do it in your brummy he was, he was hilarious you know so we wrote him into it as debbie's boyfriend derek and then along the way we just had some great people coming in you know um everybody from nicholas parsons to lenny the lion but that well, grant and i always reckon that was the best because those scripts were so um well, each episode had about four storylines running through it that would interweave and, you know, we were really getting into the characters and the situations. Uh, so, we, yeah, we loved that show and um, we were very sad. It only lasted for three series. Uh, it's very sad, uh, considering the other ones ran for a lot longer. Um, so you wrote um, a lot of sitcoms back in the early days. Um, and what I wanted to ask was, um, what what's it like writing a sitcom for a, a younger audience? Is it difficult? Um, some may think that um, a grown-up sitcom is more difficult or clever to write than a kid's one. Is that the case, or is it just as difficult? I don't think there's any difference, really. I mean... Spats, for instance, was shown in Canada at eight o'clock in the evening as an adult sitcom. Um, Teabag and Michelangelo weren't so sophisticated, but a lot of the jokes and a lot of the things in it were, you know, adults, I think, appreciated. You know, um, really, Grant and I were just writing stuff that made us laugh. You know, we, we were having a great time doing it. You know, we'd never obviously put in anything adult, you know, that were, but as, as long as the situations were funny and the kids could understand what was happening, I mean, everything I've ever done, and most writers who have kids telly, you know, I think would say the same. We, we do put in a lot of sophisticated stuff because the best kids shows aren't just simple kids shows. I mean, I, I love Sesame Street, you know, and... So you watch Sesame Street, and there's so many wonderful things in it for adults because, you know, parents are going to be watching it with kids and they're going to be bored rigid if it's just, you know, very, very simple stuff. So, no, I, I think it's just as hard um, to write stuff for kids. Maybe hard, I don't know. But we certainly, um, you know, we, we, we worked very hard on this stuff, you know, to try and make it as funny and interesting and new as possible, Good. It's it's nice. It's nice when people put in the effort because um, sometimes kids' TV can be looked on as low effort or whatever, and sometimes there is some low effort stuff out there, but it's always nice yeah, when you get the stuff absolutely. that has had the time and the effort and the money put into it, which is something that I, I don't think happens as much as it used to, unfortunately, but it's the way things I mean, are. I, the, the thing that, you know, the, the, the children's television kind of thing that really, you know, depresses me is the kind of... When you resort to a gunge tank or current you know covering people in slime and that kind of you know you've seen it so many times you know um and we were kind of trying to write really interesting stories you know and some of them are quite weird really you know um quite, i think they were quite spats i think was pretty sophisticated actually if you look at some of those stories 
Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, it's just funny really you say that. There's so much stuff I can remember from my childhood that involved gunge tanks. You do have a point. They, what, they were very well, heavy. I mean, I'm just, you know, I mean, I know it's entertaining up to a point, you know. Um, but, you know, children's television has got that kind of, you know, sometimes it has that, you know, oh, it's just people messing around and, you know, being, acting like children. I think that's what it is, you know. Uh, it's, you know, when presenters are acting like kids, I, I I find that, you know, not terribly interesting. Whereas, you know, the characters in Spats were adults, you know, yeah. they were having boyfriend and girlfriend and money problems and all sorts of things, you know. Uh, but even in Teabag and Mike and Angelo, I, you know, I still think there were some sort of interesting stories, you know. Yeah. Good, good. And I mean, we'll move on to um, some of your more recent stuff in a moment. But um, one, one last thing I did want to ask is, you know, how do you feel that, um, you know, those early shows that you that you wrote with Grant, um, how, how does it feel that, like, all this time later, people are still talking about them? If anybody does a conversation online about old CITV shows, chances are those three will be mentioned. And not only that, um, as I said earlier, um, when CITV did its anniversary about 10 years ago, they did repeat those shows and they trended on Twitter. So how mm. cool is that? Yeah. No, I think it's great. I mean, we always felt, Grant and I always thought, you know, we should be working for the BBC, you know, because the BBC are the company who promote their stuff. And when we started, there were hundreds, oh, not hundreds, there were dozens of ITV companies, you know, there was Yorkshire Television and the Thames Television and the East Anglia Television. And these companies were kind of feuding a bit with each other, you know, that they all wanted, you know, a share of money to make their own program so i felt our shows didn't have like you know the bbc would put themselves behind whether it was like tony robinson doing maid marion or something like that you know the bbc would really get behind it and push it whereas we felt we were struggling a bit you know and thames television weren't really you know pushing it so at the time we were thinking you know, why aren't we why aren't we doing books? Why aren't there videos out of this? You know, there's one one video of Teabag, you know, ever came out originally. Um we Grant and I were asked to write a teabag book, which we did, but there just wasn't that kind of push. So we always felt a bit neglected in a way. Um so yeah, it's really nice years later that, you know, people are remembering it. But to try and get Teabag out on DVD. I mean, it was a nightmare, you know. Um, I spent years, you know, trying to get somebody to do that. And um, at one point, I can't remember who it was now, I think it was Fremantle or something. Anyway, whoever it was said, yeah, we're not going to do it until we have, like, I think they wanted, like, a petition with, like, two or 3,000 names on it saying, we want the DVD. And we did. There was, you know, there was a petition online. And when it got to about two or 3,000 names... I printed it out, you know, it was like a telephone dial. It was massive, you know, and I took it up there and said, there you go, put it on the taste. <laughs> There's, you know, it took so long. It was so difficult, you know, and finally they did the DVD. They got to series three of Teabag and then said, oh, I'm not doing anymore, which is very disappointing. Mike and Angelo has never been out on anything. There's never been a DVD. There's not been a video. There's not been a book or anything, you know. Um, Spats, there was a book, but we didn't write it. Um, so, yeah, it's great. I mean, it's great. You know, and that's why I wanted to do the Teabag reunion DVDs. There was so much love for Teabag. I said, you know, if we could get everybody together, as many people together in one place, which was my house, and we'll have a great tea party and we'll interview everybody. And um, it was fabulous. You know, we had both tea bags there at different times, unfortunately. They were never together. But, you know, we had um, obviously John Hassler, lots of the cast, Matt Zimmerman, Jim Norton, who obviously Bishop Brennan from yes. Father Ted, you know, he was he was set. Um, you know, the directors, um, the composers, the costume designer, everybody turned up and we made this fabulous DVD because we thought they're not gonna do it, so we'll do it ourselves. So yeah, yeah it's great. It's great, it's got a cult following, but kind of disappointing in a way that, you know, it didn't get that push at the time that we felt it should have had him. Yeah, definitely. I think me and Tim said, you know, it's surprising that um, Michelangelo hasn't been considered for a DVD release, considering its longevity. 
Um, mm. I was thinking actually when you were saying about Thames that it survived the fact that Thames um, stopped existing at one point and it became Tetra, well, didn't it really? And, and Carlton. Well, what that. happened was, I mean, Grant and I were on a high, really. You know, we were working at Thames, we had an office at Thames. Um, we were writing to Teabag, Mike and Angelo and Spat simultaneously. And then one day we went into work and Margaret Thatcher was um, doing this thing where she's decided to auction off the franchises and everyone was gathered around a TV set watching, thinking, oh, obviously, Thames will carry on. And she had this thing going. She didn't like Thames at all because they'd made this um, controversial uh, documentary um, about the IRA, which she didn't like. So she had it in for Thames. Anyway, Thames lost its franchise that moment. And all of our shows were dead immediately. Teabag, Mike and Angelo and Spats were just dead. So Carlton Television took over. They won the franchise bid. They were the new guys. And um, Michael Forte, who was the new head of children's at Carlton, said, well, we can pick one of the three shows that you've got on to keep going. And we were thinking, I hope it's Teabag. I hope, oh, sorry, I hope it's Spats, really, you know, but it could be too. Anyway, he chose Mike and Angelo, and that's how Mike and Angelo kept going after the other two were killed off. Um, yeah, and it went on for years after that. But, yeah, that, that was a real blow to Thames Television when it lost its franchise and lost all those shows. Mm. Tetra was... Um, Alan Horrocks, who was the head of Thames Children's Programmes, when that happened and he left and started his own company, Tetra Films, and said to Grant and I, come with me and we'll make lots more shows. So he took over, you know, making Mike and Angelo. And also we, uh, th- no, actually before that, I think we'd done the Tomorrow People. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we'd done the Tomorrow People. Yeah, well, that was still at Thames. Um so yeah, we went off to work for Tetra Films and started doing stuff and yeah, it was different. You know, Spats, which we loved, Alan said, well, we'll do a new show like Spats called Cone Zone, which was a kind of cheaper <laughs> version. Um, and then he said, yeah, we'll do a new show um, like the Tomorrow People, which was called Delta Wave. Um, oh, yeah, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. so we, you know, I mean, Delta Wave was a really good show. It only lasted for 10 episodes, but actually it was pretty cool, actually. Um, Cone Zone was pretty good, but it was just like a cheaper version of Spats, you know, and it was so, yeah, we did we did tons of stuff with Tetra Films um, over the years. Some of it was OK and some of it not so OK. Not so OK was the remaking of Rainbow. Yeah. Which, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Alan said one day, we're going to remake Rainbow. And I thought, great, this is the chance to make Rainbow really brilliant. You know, um, I was the only person around who'd actually worked on the original Rainbow. So I got drafted in. Uh, it just wasn't quite the same um, in so many ways. <laughs> so, yeah, that didn't work. Um, but, yeah, it was... Uh, yeah, all of that stuff, you know, we were busy, you know. I mean, Grant and I were always busy. Alan let us do a lot of stuff. Um, but, yeah, we were never going to get any stuff at the BBC. I mean, the BBC hated Teabag. They hated the stuff that we were doing. And the odd time that we tried to get in the door at the BBC, we just had the door slammed in our face every time. So we just thought, sod it, we'll carry on working for ITV. Crazy. But you got a lot of work out of it for a long time. I mean, you just talk about yeah. the Tetra stuff. I mean, I'm aware that there was a, a few of us as well, like um, Poltergeist and Snap. Was that the other one as well that you did? Yeah, yeah. Snap was, um, yeah, Snap was an idea that um, they thought, how can we use the Michelangelo house in another series? <laughs> um, and I didn't want to do it. I uh, I said, I, I really don't want to do that show, particularly Grant decided he would do it. Mm-hmm. But then I was given the chance uh, to write my own sitcom, and that was how Poltergeist came about. I did that on my own. I was, I thought it was really good, actually. You know, I mean, I, it, it had such a rough treatment, though. It was 
when it came out, it was shown on different days. It, there was no it, it, on a Monday one day and a Tuesday another day. Then there was a bank holiday, so it was off. Anyway, it, it got quite good figures, and it got to the end of there was only eight episodes, and they said, "Oh, we'll repeat it," and it all you know, and they never repeated it, so it never kind of really took off and it was like completely forgotten but i I really enjoyed working on that um and again you know we had some great guests we had some wonderful people in it yeah that was uh that was a really big disappointment for me that show actually but um yeah kind of all good things come to an end and i then had a period where i didn't really do anything for a while and it was getting a bit rough and um I thought, I don't know, I'm maybe never going to work again. And then suddenly I got into animation, yeah. which I'd never done before. And suddenly, I couldn't believe my luck. You know, I got a gig working on um, Sean the Sheet, The Secret Show, and Frankenstein's Cat, which were three brilliant shows. I mean, The Secret Show, I think, is one of the most brilliant neglected kind of sort of animations ever i love doing that but sean the sheep was the first one and um so yeah that was great you know who wouldn't want to work with the people who make wallace and gromit uh, it was fabulous so i said yeah, so, so i started writing scripts for sean the sheep and i kind of like doing silent stuff and obviously that was silent and after a while the script editor left and i kind of took over as script editor and writer and pretty much ended up being the head writer on the show. Um, and I loved it. Yeah, it was wonderful. Um, and then at the same time, I think pretty much writing these other shows, you know, Secret Show and Frankenstein's Cat, you know, which were both brand new original. Sh- well, all those three were original shows. And um, yeah, but then once I got into the wonderful world of animation, you suddenly start getting out. There's long running shows that have been going for years. So suddenly I found myself doing Thomas the Tank Engine, Fireman Sam, and loads of these other shows that have been around for ages. And um, yeah, I was suddenly king of the cartoons. You know? <laughs> but, um, so yeah, that that's what I've been doing really, I don't know, probably for the last 15, 10, 15 years is yeah. all animation stuff. Cool, cool. I did it's, notice that. It, mm-hmm. It's very, very different. You know, I mean, what what is... There's great stuff about it. I mean, what is different is that when you're writing Teabag or Mike and Angela or whatever, you know, and you, you've written a script and then you go along to a read-through and you meet all the actors and you have a read-through, which is great. Then on the studio day, you go down to the studio at Teddington and you hang around with all these wonderful actors, you know, chatting to them, having lunch and everything. And it's a great, you know, you do animation, you can't hang around with Sean the Sheep or Five and Sam. You know, the kind of social side of it's gone, you know. Yeah. So that I do try and go into the recording studio when they're, you know, when they're doing, the, you know, and so I do get a little bit occasionally of, you know, meeting up with the actors but uh yeah i kind of miss that social side of it yeah do you find it easier to write animation or live action scripts we'll say oh, they, not really I, I can't really say actually i mean they've both got their problems uh, but you know um i mean obviously in, anim- in animation you can do more wild wackies but then again you can't always because there's there's always restrictions i mean i'll give you an example um I wanted to do um, a, a Shaun and Sheep episode where there's a hot air balloon. Mm-hmm. And Ardman said, we can't afford to build a hot air balloon, so you can't do it. Okay, fair enough. And then two years later, Wallace and Gromit are in the next studio doing um, a matter of loaf and death. And they said, we've got a hot air balloon in this film. Great, can we borrow? So I, I got to do it. You know, I mean, there's always going to be you know restrictions on what you can do and what you can't do. But um, I guess you can do a few more wild things. I mean, the series I really was very fond of, I don't know whether you've come across Q Poodle 5. Um, well, that is, can't I have, sorry. It's a really lovely series, Q Poodle 5. It's set in space on a planet with this with a load of little aliens. And the design on that show was fantastic. I mean, it really was superb. So you could kind of do some great stuff in space, and on other planets and things. It just looked great, you know. 
But at the heart of it, like all of these things, it was a little sitcom about a load of aliens, really. <laughs> Kind of yeah, cool I think also. that's a, I think that's the kind of thing. Um, when I was first asked to, to do stuff like Fine and Sam, I thought oh, I, don't know, I want to do that. You know, they must have done a million different, you know, fire-related episodes about rescuing. So, what can I possibly do if I come in, you know, ten years into the show? And the head writer at the time said. Yeah, but you've got to look at it as like a, a little sitcom. You know, there are a bunch of guys working in a fire station. And and when you kind of get that, you think, actually, you're, he's right. It's like Dad's army. You know, you've got a guy called Elvis who wants to be a rock and roll star. You know, you've got these funny characters. And so you start off writing a little sitcom. And obviously there are, there has to be, you know, moments of adventure and you know, where the fire engine goes off and does stuff. But, yeah, they're all, I think all of them are like little sitcoms, really. And, you know, if you, yeah, yeah, yeah we, you know, if you like the characters and, you you know, you can, you know, whether it's George and Zippy or whether it's, you know, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've done, you know, every show's got its own little cast of weirdos and um you know it's just fun writing it yeah, yeah definitely it's amazing that you can come up with so much stuff in a small area i mean there's always the joke about you know how many fires can a small tiny village in wales have but you know um there was oh. the the original series in the 80s and 90s and then, and then it's yeah. come back but I, I was just thinking actually um and, well it wasn't a children's show but it was the same kind of thing london's burning around for donkey's yeah. years i mean how how many fires could you do in that really but they still kept it exciting for for 10, 15 years, however long that was. Well, I actually, I actually did um, sort of take the mickey out of Fireman and Sam in one episode because, you know, there's a kid in it called Norman Price. Yes. He's always getting his head stuck in the railings and having to be rescued. So I did an episode called Record Breakers where he was trying to get into the... Because it's set in Wales, I hilariously called it the Gwyneth Book of Records. Um, so he was trying to get into this... By, and he kept doing these crazy stunts, like balancing on huge mountains of baked bean tins and stuff like that. Um, and at the very end of it, he was disappointed. He, he, he ended up hanging off of a bridge, you know, and Fireman Sam had to rescue him. And he was very disappointed because he hadn't managed to get into the Gwyneth Book of Records for some stunt. And Fireman Sam said, well, actually, Norman... You know, I've rescued you 459 times, so I think you do qualify for being the boy who's been most rescued. I mean, you can do that in shows. You can kind of take the mickey out of, you know. I mean, Fireman and Sam, there was a, somebody wrote a, a, a movie called, I think it was called The Great Fire of Ponty Pandy. Yes. There was a massive fire in the town and they had to evacuate there's only about 12 characters in that town. So when they all congregated, you know, down by the beach, you know, you've got to laugh, really, because, you know, there would have been thousands of people, you know. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's, it's amazing what they managed to stretch out of a, a show that's set in such a small area. Um, I also do have a lot of people who listen to the stuff I do that are big fans of, of Thomas and, and, and friends mm. and... I always get nagged that I don't really bring it up much. <laughs> I, I watched it when I was very little, when it was the original mm. stop motion Ringo Starr era. So I'm, I'm a bit yeah. out of the loop with it, I'll be honest. But I did see that you have written quite extensively for it. Um, that's, well, uh, what's that yeah, like? yeah, that was an interesting one because years and years and years ago, before I ever got into animation, um, I was invited down to, I think it was Pinewood Studios, where they used to film the original one with the proper, you know, it was like the biggest train set in the world. It was fantastic, you know, and they were looking for writers. And unbelievably, I had actually met the Reverend Audrey who wrote the books. I'd met him, I think, when I was a teenager at some book fair. You know, he was signing books. So, I, you know, I did have a kind of... I didn't read the books as a kid, but I did have a kind of interest in it. So when I got asked if I'd write an episode, I was very excited, you know, Um and it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. These, it was a five-minute episode, and every time I wrote it, they sent it back saying, no, this isn't right, this isn't right, change this, change that. It was a nightmare. And I did this episode, and it does exist, but I was never asked to do it again. 
And then, I don't know, about 15 years later, they got in touch. It all changed by then. Everything had changed. You know, it had gone CGI, all the original people working on it. They said, would you like to write it? I said, not really, because I had such a horrible time the first time round. They said, no, give it. Anyway, I did start writing it, and I really enjoyed it. Actually, it was really good fun. And, um, yeah, again, you know, if you I know they're trains, but you know, you kind of get into it, and if you can come up with funny stories, and I, th I thought I, you know, I, I, you know, you have to be imaginative. You look and say, well, they've done so many episodes. How can he possibly come up with something they've never done? I mean, I ended up writing episode number five hundred. <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, I did. I did enjoy it. It was really good, and the CGI was brilliant. I know a lot of people love the old model you know um version the stop go you know stop motion thing but the, the cgi is brilliant actually um but uh yeah i think i wrote i don't know about 25 episodes of it and um yeah i enjoyed it good good um yeah well the one i haven't talked about which i didn't write any of it but it was a very weird and interesting job, was being script editor on Mr Bean. OK. Animated Mr Bean. Oh, right, that, um, yeah, yeah. So that was an interesting job, because I, I was... Because uh, of because I'd done all this silent stuff, you know, I'd done, um, you know, Sean and everything. I got asked, would I like to be script editor on... Oh. Well, to be honest, I'd rather have been writing Mr Bean, but anyway... I had to go up and meet Rowan Atkinson and be auditioned, really, you know, which was kind of weird. So I, I met him and we were talking about silent film. It was great. It went OK because um, I like silent films and he likes silent films. So we got on, you know, OK. So I got this gig and I said, what does it involve? And they said, well, you've got a little team of writers and they'll write scripts and send them to you and then you send them to Rowan and he'll phone you up every week and tell you what he thinks of them. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Um, to begin with, um, he would just say, I don't like that. I don't like this. I don't like that. He, I'm like, I can't disagree with him. He was right, you know, a lot of the time, you know. But it was a very weird job for six months to have Rowan Atkinson phone you up every week and tell you what a load of rubbish his scripts were. But he was right, you know, um, a lot of the time he was right, you know, and um, he's, you know, he studied at university, he studied mechanical engineering. Yeah. And he would attack every script like it was a car, you know, taking it to bits and putting it back together again. And he was really interesting. It was, a, you know, I said, I'd much rather have been writing the scripts, but my role was, you know, to go between him and the producers and sort out scripts. And, you know, by the end of it, he's, he's not, you know, it, we weren't having great chats or anything, you know, it was very down to business, you know. Um, but I, I, I kind of enjoyed those calls and um, I think I learned a lot. And after a while, I could actually say, no, I don't agree with you there, you know, and we would have a decent discussion about it. So, yeah, that was one of the strangest little jobs I had, actually. But... Uh, as I say, you know, it's all been animation for the last, you know, I don't know how long. So, a long time. <laughs> a long, 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 long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And long may it continue. What have you been working on the like the most recently? Um, I've not been doing very much lately. The last big thing I did was um, it was a French American animation series called Taffy about a raccoon. Yeah, they've started showing it, funnily enough. It's just started on um CBBC recently. Um it was it was yeah, it was a weird show. We were kind of making it uh an animation company in Paris were making it, and it was supposed to the, the idea of it was brilliant, you know, it was gonna be like the new or like going back to old fashioned Warner Brothers cartoons where people bashed each other over the head and blew each other up with dynamite, which you can never do these days. <laughs> you can't. You know, even if you, you know, even on episodes of Sean the Sheep, you know, if Sean wanted to use a hammer or something, you know, he'd have to wear a hard hat and goggles, you know, for safety reasons. And you'd go, why? This is mad, you know. Um, but Taffy was designed to be an old fashioned Warner Brothers cartoon where, you know, a dog and a raccoon were spending there. It was like Roadrunner, you know, chasing each other around. Anyway, um, I did 
20 episodes of that show. Um, and, uh, yeah, they didn't all turn out as with many things. They, the, the scripts, uh, the, the animators like changing things, you know, so a lot of stuff was changed, I don't think, for the better. But it was a, you know, it was an interesting job to start with. Um, I think that was the last big thing I've done. I, the, the, recently, I've been involved in loads of developing stuff that never gets made. Um, I got asked by, you know, um, Jerry Anderson, yeah. the Thunderbirds guy. Mm -hmm. His son, Jamie Anderson, was trying to get a new live action um, drama, teenage drama off the ground. And I, I worked on that, developing that. It was a Canadian thing. Nothing. I've never heard, you know. Um, and yeah, loads of stuff like that happens. You get asked to work and develop stuff and it just disappears and never gets made. So I haven't got any budding new shows I can tell you about, I'm afraid. That's OK. Um, it happens. Uh, yeah. But you never know, you know, the phone could go tomorrow or not. And, um, you know, I should go back to doing books again. Probably publishing is as difficult to get into now as... Um, TV, because I can't imagine these days ever being able to make a show like Teabag or Mike and Angelo, where we we just didn't have any interference, really. You know, I mean, obviously there's a producer and a director and they would have their views and we'd make changes, but nowadays you're kind of working with committees of people and focus groups and all sorts of different people, you know. Yeah, definitely. So Definitely. I don't want to, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to end on a downer, but um, <laughs> no, not at all. Not, you know, things have changed very much. Yeah. They have indeed, and you're not the first person to say on on the podcast. Oh, okay. But it's oh, been uh, it, it's mm. been lovely to hear all the you know the great memories of those top shows, and you know I wish you all the best in the future, and uh, hope that you know some more okay. work comes uh, what comes your yeah, way. Thank you very much, and uh, yeah, it's been really enjoyable. Well, nice to meet you. Anyway, nice to meet you too. It's been really good. Enjoyed. Good. Thank you very much. Good stuff. Well, okay. we'll speak to you soon. Yeah, thanks very much. Bye, Thank Jack. Bye-bye. Bye. A big thanks to Lee for sharing his memories and also a big thanks to Videotape FTW on YouTube for helping make this interview possible. Well, that's it for another episode. There will be another interview coming up very shortly. I'll be back very soon. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.